march of time. years ago, the ancient city of Rome was the capital of a great and mighty empire, which gave to the Western world its laws, its government, and its culture. Today, within Rome's limits is an independent state, Vatican City, the physical capital of a great spiritual empire, whose followers of every race and nationality share a common faith, the belief in one God, the Father the Son, and the Holy Ghost. To the Church of Rome's 330 million communicants, one man is supreme as their infallible spiritual ruler, His Holiness Pius XII, Pope of Rome, and Vicar of Christ on Earth. And in the war world of today, to millions of others, Pius XII is a leader in the struggle of the God-fearing against the forces of the godless. For at one of the darkest periods in the world's history, 63-year-old Eugenio, Cardinal Pacelli, ascending the throne of St. Peter, pledged himself in the name of the pontiff before him to carry on his crusade to seek peace and goodwill for all mankind. Ceaselessly since the outbreak of war, the Roman pontiff has been praying and working in the cause of a righteous peace. In the printed word of every known language, Pius XII has been militant against what in his eyes seem the greatest enemies of Christianity, communism and Nazism. Today, one of the most widely read newspapers in all Europe is the Vatican's official organ, the Daily Osservatore Romano, whose editor, Count Giuseppe Della Torre, faithfully reflects the pontiff's views. The powerful Vatican City shortwave radio, gift of the late great inventor Marconi, carries the messages of the church abroad into millions of homes in lands where church and churchmen are all but outlawed. Cardinal Halam, primate of Poland who escaped to Rome, has reported to Pope Pius XII about conditions in his stricken country. His eminence states, quote, in Poland, destitution and destruction are not confined to that part of the country under Russian occupation. Even more terrible are conditions in the part of Poland that has fallen to German administration. The Polish people, Catholics and Jews alike, face starvation as their reserves of foodstuffs and their tools of trade are taken from them and are shipped to Germany." Unquote. To Rome and to Vatican City this year, are coming scores of state missions and members of royal families, rulers and potentates, all to be received officially with the honors due their rank and titles. For more important than at any time in modern church history are the diplomatic relations between the Holy See and the nations of the world, great and small, belligerent and non-belligerent. Today, the Papal Secretary of State Luigi Cardinal Maglioni occupies one of the most important offices in the hierarchy of the Church of Rome. As chief of the Papal Diplomatic Corps, Cardinal Maglioni is the man who is busiest furthering the peace efforts of the Pope. On the diplomatic list of regularly accredited envoys to the Vatican are ambassadors and ministers from 38 nations, the largest of them Great Britain, the smallest the tiny Republic of San Marino. And for the first time in nearly 75 years, the President of the United States has sent a special emissary to the Holy See to lend American support to Pius XII in the cause of peace. At Vatican City today is Myron Charles Taylor, a lifelong Episcopalian, who, as Franklin Roosevelt's personal representative, holds the rank of Ambassador Extraordinary. Behind the medieval walls which surround the Vatican, 
built in the 9th century for protection against Saracen invaders, is a completely independent state, barely one-sixth of a mile from end to end. Since the 14th century, it has been the home of the popes of Rome, and to the Roman Church, the center of all Christendom. For nearly 60 years, from 1870, when the old papal state was absorbed into the new kingdom of Italy, no pope set foot outside the Vatican walls. But in 1929, the Lateran Treaty restored the Vatican's autonomy. And though but a fraction of its former size, it again enjoyed its own government and had its own access to the outside world. Since 1929, the 1,000 inhabitants of Vatican City have been citizens not of Italy, but of the Papal State. Highest lay authority in the Vatican State is its governor, Marquis Camillo Serafini, who is responsible to the Pope for the administration of all civil affairs. Vatican City has its own currency, lire, which are minted chiefly as commemorative pieces. Its post office carries on a thriving international trade with philatelists, who are customers for each new stamp. In Italy, all Vatican mail is considered the inviolate property of a neutral sovereign state. Citizens and employees of Vatican City have the privilege of trading in a commissary store, whose stocks are exempt from Italian taxation and other wartime restrictions. Many delicacies and staples, unobtainable in Roman shops, are available at low prices, but only to bona fide residents of the Papal State. At the Vatican City's single bar, next to lemonade, the most popular drink is coffee. Today, the most hard to get luxury in all Italy. In the Papal State, only such enterprises as are necessary to the maintenance and repair of the 1,600-year-old ecclesiastical community are carried on. To meet the changing needs of the times, the late Pius XI sanctioned extensive modernization of the Vatican. And today, this work is still being carried on. Vatican buildings, erected centuries ago, palaces, museums, libraries, and churches, are in continual need of restoration and repair. And to keep up the 15 acres of Vatican gardens, first laid out by Pope Nicholas III in 1277, requires the full-time services of scores of caretakers, who, like all Vatican workmen, are required to lead lives above moral reproach. An army of nearly 300 employees is required for daily house cleaning alone. A never-ending process in the countless corridors and rooms of the great churches and galleries that make up the Vatican. Through centuries of experience and research, the Vatican has developed its own methods of preserving art treasures from deterioration. And a corps of experts is constantly engaged in the work of restoration. In worldwide use today is a technique of book salvage developed and perfected in the Vatican's manuscript clinic. Rich in treasure and tradition, forever being modernized and forever unchanged, the temporal realm of the popes of Rome has endured for 16 centuries. Accumulated through the centuries behind the walls of the Vatican Library is the greatest and most important collection of ancient manuscripts in the world. For it was the Roman Church which preserved and recorded the accumulated knowledge of mankind through the dark ages that followed the fall of imperial Rome. Ages in which monasteries were the only refuge of thoughtful men who devoted their lives to the pursuit of wisdom. In the Vatican's crowded archives, recorded in thousands of rare documents, is the long struggle between Europe's popes and emperors for temporal supremacy. Nowhere else in the world are their treasures surpassing those collected in the Vatican galleries. When the first relics of Imperial Rome's forgotten culture were unearthed by Renaissance archaeologists, the popes, insatiable art collectors, acquired the prized pieces for their palaces. For centuries, the popes commanded the talents of the greatest artists of each age. 
filled their galleries and their chapels, impressed upon man the splendor of the Church of Rome. It was upon the walls and ceiling of the famed Sistine Chapel that Popes Julius II and Paul III set Michelangelo to work. And out of his 12 years of inspired labor came masterpieces as great as any ever created, his immortal murals of the creation and the last judgment. But all the splendors and all the treasures of the Vatican cannot match in grandeur the first cathedral of the world, the 400-year-old Basilica of St. Peter's. centuries into this towering shrine of Christendom, preserved for the glory of God, has gone the painstaking work of the great creators, the world's mighty men of art. Directly under the cathedral's great dome and beneath its high altar are the low vaulted crypt where nearly all the popes of Rome lie entombed. Here every morning for centuries, priests have come from all over the world to offer the sacrifice of the mass in a chapel which is the sepulcher of the first and greatest of pontiffs, the Apostle Peter. Church of Rome is today a modern institution. It is basically identical with the medieval church, upholding the same doctrines and conferring the same sacraments. For four centuries, the protection of the Pope and all his possessions has been entrusted to his personal soldiery, the Pontifical Swiss Guards. 100 well-disciplined troops with a long and distinguished tradition. Only members of the oldest Roman aristocracy are eligible for membership in the pontiff's noble guard, a body of 80 commissioned officers who serve as honorary escort at all formal functions. Both Swiss and noble guards are a part of the papal household, administered by Monsignor Arborio Mele de Santelia, master of the chamber, upon whom rests the responsibility of running a palace so vast no man knows all its rooms. And Monsignor Mela must act as major domo of a court bound by an inflexible etiquette. More than any temporal ruler, His Holiness the Pope is surrounded by ritual and tradition. For as Pius XII, he is the 262nd successor to Peter the Fisherman, Prince of the Apostles. And with the vestments and symbols of this high office, he has assumed the obligation Christ laid upon Peter nearly 2,000 years ago. To Rome and the Vatican each year come hundreds of thousands of visitors and devout pilgrims, many of them to fulfill a lifelong desire to be received in public audience by His Holiness and to carry away with them his apostolic blessing. Outside the Vatican limits is the oldest Christian church in Europe, the Church of St. John Lateran. Called the mother of all churches, it is by tradition the seat of the popes, 
as bishops of Rome. Nowhere in the world is there a city so steeped in the influence of the church and its teaching. In residence at the North American College are more than 200 seminarians from nearly every diocese in the United States. Militant in the army of the Church of Rome are the monastic orders from which for centuries have come the teachers and missionaries who have spread and are still spreading the doctrines of their faith. Most famous of theological seminaries is the Gregorian University, maintained at Rome by the Society of Jesus. Today, the Jesuits number more than 26,000 ordained priests who have met the rigid intellectual and spiritual requirements of an order whose members are subject to the strictest military discipline. Famed for their zeal and learning, Jesuits have played many a major role in church history. Number one Jesuit today is the amiable Father General, Vladimir Ledichovsky, who is known far and wide as the Black Pope. More than three centuries older than the Society of Jesus is the Order of Dominicans, whose general headquarters is in Rome's ancient monastery of Santa Sabina. Father General of the Dominicans is the most reverend Father Martin Gillet, head of an order which for 700 years has preached the gospel of Christ. Today, all the monastic orders of the Church of Rome, all of its 300,000 priests, all of its 2,000 archbishops and bishops, and its threescore princes of the Church, know that the supreme pontiff to whom they owe spiritual allegiance, to whom they turn for guidance, stands in need of all their devotion and their prayers. For Pius XII, as head of a great Christian faith, has announced without reservation that he is willing to assume the initiative and the responsibility for attempting to consolidate the strength of all the God-fearing people of the world in one mighty effort to end the Second World War with a truly just and lasting peace. Because Pius XII believes such a peace must come before the power of the godless destroys all Europe and the uncounted millions of all Christendom. Marches on.